Praise God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him all above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Heavenly Father, Today we bow in humility and in appreciation and in praise and in love before you. Our hearts are ready to receive what you have to say to us. Our lips are ready to parse the words that you would have us first to hear and have us to speak. We embrace the world with its pain and its sorrow, and we intercede for all that we know and many that we know not. We join our hearts and our minds together to pray for all as we say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. We pray all of our prayers in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Jesus, our Lord. Amen. This is the day that the Lord our God has made. And we shall rejoice and we shall be glad in it. I welcome you today to the fellowship of joy. This is where we meet. This is when we meet. This is indeed how we meet as we gather from places scattered around the world to experience the word of God, to experience the fellowship of God's people, to experience God's love and God's grace and God's abundant mercy and acceptance of us, his people. This indeed is his day, and we do indeed rejoice in it. One word, really two words today. If you can remember no other words, no condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. We are flawed people. We have always been flawed people. God has never worked with anything but flawed People. You say, well, what about Job, the blameless one? Well, relatively so, I suppose. But Job had some things to learn, didn't he? Every 
example of humanity through whom God worked in Genesis, in Exodus, in Leviticus, in Numbers, in First and Second Samuel, in First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles, throughout the history and throughout the time of the prophets in the Hebrew Scriptures, had issues. Take Jacob. Take Esau, take Isaac and Rebecca, who form and whose story forms our Old Testament background lesson for today. It can be summarized in these words. Isaac loved Jacob because he was fond of game, but Rebecca loved Jacob. Esau was a hunter and brought his dad great food that he had hunted and killed and butchered and prepared. But Jacob, ah, he was the apple of his mother's eye. And there's a flaw. One parent favoring one and another parent favoring another. They created a dysfunctional relationship so that Jacob was willing to cheat Esau out of his birthright and Esau was willing to sell his birthright just for a meal. Jacob flaunted it Esau resented it forever. The covenant, the special covenant that had been passed on from Abraham to Isaac was passed to Jacob, who came to be known as Israel. And Esau was left out into the, in the cold. Most traditions see Esau as the father of the Edomites. It's very interesting. They coexisted for many years. They fought for many years. They had a tense relationship for many years. But then during the period of the Hasmoneans, they were either adopted or conscripted back into the family of Israel. And the remaining Edomites in the land actually became Jews and joint heirs with Isaac and Jacob and the people of Israel, but they were flawed. Here's what does not happen in the book of Genesis when the story is told. There's not a lot of commentary on the sin. There's just a noting of the process, of the history, of the story. It's already assumed that in our selfish self-interest we act selfishly isaiah however interjects in isaiah 55 that as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return until they have watered the earth making it bring forth and sprout giving seed to the sower and bread to the eaters, so shall my word that goes forth from my mouth be. It shall not return empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in that for which I sent it. There is no human flaw or fallacy or fallibility of human nature that can ultimately prevent the purposes and the plan of God in time and space and eternity. God's going to get his job done, and he's either going to work with or through or around human beings. And his desire, his stated desire, is to work in partnership with human beings. But whatever human beings tend to do to thwart the plan of God, God has a better plan and determination. 
Jesus said that at any, any time and at any space, the sower goes forth to sow in Matthew 13. The sower went forth to sow and some of the seed fell on good ground and it sprouted, took root, grew up, bore most, uh, more fruit. But there were other kinds of soil, rocky soil, hard soil, thorny soil. And these eventually got, the seeds got plucked away or they got choked out or something happened so that those seeds did not take root, grow up and bear fruit. Seeds are constantly being sown. Sometimes the ground is ready. Sometimes the ground is not ready, but the word of God always accomplishes whatever it's going to be purposed by God to accomplish. But we are flawed. We are the rocky soil. We are the thorny soil. We are the hard soil. And sometimes we are the good soil through which God can plant his seed and we can enter into a relationship of cooperation with God. Sometimes in our lives, there is that kind of soil all mixed and we have areas of our life that are good soil and areas of our life that are thorny and areas of our lives that are hard and other areas that um, it just it just doesn't take root and there are periods of our life now in Romans 7 Paul struggled with his flaws and he struggled with his sinful humanity and he struggled with the concept of sin living inside of him alongside the new life that he'd received in Christ and he describes uh, having what seems to be two natures. That's the best he could come up with, and it's the best we could understand. And so the word of God delivers that message to us with that metaphor, that we have two natures as followers of Jesus. Otherwise, we can't explain the fact that we'll wake up someday and follow an impulse that will lead to a bad decision and uh, will act out of resentment or will act out of anger or will act out of uh, malice or will act out of selfishness. Why is that? And the world will look at us and we'll look at ourselves in the mirror and said, and you call yourself a Christian, a follower of Jesus. And we do because is Jesus who looked at the woman caught in adultery who was being condemned by the law. By the way, the psalmist who wrote, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And I have, uh, in, I've set my intention on that word, did not always follow through on his best intentions, did he? We're a mixed bag, we are, and we're frustrated. And we look in the mirror and we want to condemn ourselves, but Jesus looks at this woman and after speaking to the accuser says, tell you what, your law says, our law, God's law, says that she's worthy of death by stoning. Okay, that's the standard. I won't lower the standard in this case, but but let the one who is sinless, the one who has never sinned, that has never strayed, that has never exercised the flaws of life, that has never been worthy of condemnation in some way, let that person be the one to pick up the first stone and throw it at this woman. He knew their hearts. He knew human nature. He knew who we are. And one by one, 
beginning with the eldest, they walked away. And he looked at her and he said, who's left to condemn you? And she, she said, I don't see anybody. He said, well, I don't condemn you either. But go and sin no more. Did Jesus believe she would never sin for the rest of her life? No, I don't think so. But he set her on a path of intention. He set her on a path of the spirit. He set her on the path of grace. There is, therefore, Paul says, at the close of Romans 7, where he expresses his frustration and it culminates in, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now, what was the law? And what is the law? And what is the function of the law? Well, in verse 3 of Romans 8, Paul says that the law was weakened by the flesh. He, he doesn't say the law was bad, but the law was weakened by the flesh. And what the flesh could not do, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to deal with sin. Where's the condemnation? Well, Romans 8.3 says he condemned sin in the flesh. What is sin? Harmartia is the Greek word. It means not being able to hit the bullseye, shooting the arrow and missing the bullseye, missing the mark. Well, have you ever hit the bullseye? <laughs> a bowling. You like bowling? I took a class in bowling. I had to take a one year of physical education, believe it or not, for my degree from college. And so one semester I took a class in bowling, a one semester hour class. One credit. I guess it made me a better human being, but it didn't make me a better bowler. <laughs> I might have hit one strike, but it was an accident. I got a lot of balls in the gutter. I'm a better bowler now, but I'm not a good bowler, and I seldom bowl. But life has made me a little bit more hand-eye coordinated, not much. And I might hit a few more strikes, but I still hit the gutter. Do I aim for the gutter? No. Do they change the rules or the setup for me? No. Does the standard weaken? No. Can I go home with a smile on my face saying, uh, it's been a good life for the last hour and a half? Yes. Why? Because of grace. Because of the spirit. I never aimed for the gutter. I didn't like it when I went in the gutter. You know what the gutter is in bowling. That's the side where the ball rolls. For th those of you who are not familiar with some of our American games, you roll the ball, you try to knock down these pins, and, uh, it, and there are 10 of them. And uh, the, you get points for every one you knock down. But you get mega points when you knock them all down at once. And you get pretty good points, extra points, when you knock them down in two, in two rolls of the ball. That's called a spare. But uh, if your ball rolls off to the side, there's this uh, indentation called a gutter. And the ball goes in there, and uh, you're out of luck. Well, we try. We fail. We get back up. And verse 4 of Romans 8 says, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the spirit, flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live in according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit, life and peace. 
For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law. It cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So the apostle Paul is saying a lot of this is about mindset. Is our mind set on the spirit or the flesh? Are we checking off boxes? Are we trying to commend ourselves or condemn ourselves? Or are we constantly focusing and refocusing on God through Jesus Christ in the spirit where there is freedom? There is no lowering of the standard. In fact, there is a raising of the standard. Take the standard of giving. I'm going to apply it to a church giving. You know, a church is a, is a local body of people who become an entity. And uh, our churches, the churches that I've pastored through the years, have been committed to giving and to missional giving, to giving beyond ourselves, beyond our own budget. And yet, at the same time, we had obligations for over 45 years uh, as a pastor was a steward of uh, organizational church that had obligations. We had obligations to our creditors. We had obligations to our, uh, to our uh, lenders, to our mortgage uh, companies. We had obligations to our utility providers. We had obligations to our employees because we had obligations to our employees. We had obligations to the state and to the federal government to uh, pay our portion of their taxes and social security. We had obligations uh, to take care of local needs, but we also had obligations that were really just obligations to God and to the mission of God in the world to support the missions to which we had committed. But we got behind in all of those things. More than once. And there was a time when we would just, and with my endorsement, we would put the mission giving in the debt column. And I would watch that thing rise and rise and rise. And every time we would give to God through the mission work, uh, instead of rejoicing in what we were doing, we would say, okay, we reduced the debt a little bit. And that illustrated in my life and it all came together at one point that there are debts we can never pay. And th these, the sense of debt is a focus on the flesh. It's a focus on condemnation or commendation and checking off boxes. And one day I just sat down with our leadership and I asked this question, wouldn't it be better if instead of putting these things in the debt column and instead of just focusing on what we owe, that we would just start giving again because it discouraged us from doing anything. It was almost becoming an all or nothing proposition. I'm gonna do it all, I'm gonna be perfect or I'm gonna be nothing. Have you ever? found that to be a relatable truth in your life. I'm either going to be perfect or I'm just going to give up. I'm going to quit trying. So we said that rather than take that high standard that we were setting for ourselves and do nothing because we couldn't meet it, let's do something. Let's start doing something and let's do it by grace. And let's do it with joy. And let's do it in the spirit. And then we found that we were able to do something. That we were able to move in the direction of the spirit. And I've had those moments in my own life. When I have applied grace to my life. No condemnation. And no unnecessary commendation. Because those in the flesh cannot please God. We will not be flawless. Can't go back and interject some spiritual meaning to, uh, to Isaac favoring 
Jacob and Rebecca favoring Esau and somehow or another justify it. Because God worked through it, he did work through it, but we can't change their motives. <laughs> Isaac liked wild meat. And for whatever reason, Rebecca favored Esau. And you can't reinterpret uh, the motives of Jacob, uh, of Isaac, cheating his brother Esau or Esau's impulsiveness in the story. Just know that God was there and God was working it out. And God was accepting and loving those people in spite of their flaws. You're not in the flesh, Paul says in verse 9. You're in the spirit. Since the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ doesn't belong to him. This is spiritually saying. This is spiritual. We relate to God and we relate to Christ and we relate to the Holy Spirit in the realm of the spirit. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. This is a grand invitation to no condemnation. Do we lower the standard? No. Do we stop Repenting of our sins? No, the good news is the message that you can repent. You can change around your suffering. There can be uh, a new life. You may never be able to pay off all of your debts. You cannot erase every bad mistake you have ever made. But you can live in the spirit. You can live in the joy of repentance, mind change life change. You can live in the dance of God. You can live in the joy of God. You are not condemned. Yes, in the flesh, Jesus condemned the sin, but you, my friend, have been set free from the law of sin and death in Christ. Say yes to that today. Say yes to Jesus' great invitation say yes to God's warm embrace. May that be your prayer. Yes. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen and amen and amen and amen and amen and amen. Men again.